God God gave me a lot of things to tell you. And it's so exciting. It's so exciting to just to be. I feel like this mic is tiny. Okay. Um, it's, it's actually really exciting to be a, to be a, a how do I say, a messenger. Tell me now. Tell me now. The name. The title. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's actually very exciting. I have I have a, a lot of things to tell you. Um, I don't I don't actually know where I'm going to start from, but I'll start from somewhere. Um. Okay. So before. Thank you. All right, so before I start uh, painting and I start sharing with you my story, um, can we just quickly turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 31? I'll be doing this by my fourth movement. I'll try my best to do it as fast as I can. Okay, sorry, before you go to Jeremiah 31, please open your Bibles to Psalm 23. Psalm 23. It's a popular Bible, Bible chapter. Um, are we all there? Okay, so Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I lack. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He renews my life. He leads me among the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I go through the darkest valley, I fear no danger, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff may comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup, runs, my cup overflows. Only goodness and faithful love will pursue me. And some versions that says, your beauty and your peace will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's read Jeremiah 31 now. Um, I'm going to start from um, verse 1. It says, At that time, this is the Lord's at that time, this is the Lord's declaration. I will be God of all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. For, um, they found favor in the wilderness, the people who survived the sword. <clears throat> They found favor in the wilderness, the people who survived the sword. When Israel went to find rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love to you. Amen. So, um, I, was reading, I was reading the book of Psalm, Psalm 23, last night. Chapter. And when I was thinking about my whole life, 
I thought about I thought about that you know that chapter it just resonated with me. Now um, let me just let me quickly start so that as we talk we would we would go on so that we don't waste time. Um, I'm going to try to explain as many things as I can as we as we go on. So please just try and follow me because I'm definitely going somewhere. Don't worry if you can't see me yet. Very soon you will. Thank you. God bless you. 
A car pulled up beside me and there were two men inside. And both of them were holding guns. And one of them came out of the car and says, get in the car. I know <laughs> this kind of thing is like Nigerian film. You don't know what it is. It doesn't happen to you every day. I mean, just go out to bike and someone called me go and say she enter the car. It's like so I stood, I first of all paused, you know, trying to see if maybe I was on set. <laughs> There's somebody somewhere holding a camera or something. I just know that okay. But it was real life. So he asked me to get in the car and he coughed his gun. That's when he said, okay, things just go real, just go serious. So I got in the car and we were driving around. He asked me where I worked, what I did, what I was doing there. Um, I had about, I had 2,000, I didn't even know I had 2,000 dollars on my wallet. They helped me to discover it. <laughs> but I had 2,270 naira inside my wallet. And he kept asking, why don't you have money? I said, I'm actually going to use the ATM. He said, it's fine. We'll help you. So he took my ATM card, asked me to close my eyes. They kept asking me to close my eyes. But you know, I, mean, I have a very, if I say this now, it's a big of it. I was going to say, I have a very stubborn spirit. In some ways, it's good. In some ways, I'm still working on it. Thank God for God. So I was just like, I can't be closing my eyes. I don't know what, I don't know where we're going. So I don't know who you are. I can't just be inside the car and close my eyes. So um, they ruffled me up a bit. When I say they ruffled me up, get to start. Because they can't, people like that can't tell you to do things and then you just openly disobey them. And so I gave them my ATM card. Um, I did close my eyes at some point because the stuff was just. <laughs> so. Um, they stopped somewhere, a, a third person, a third person came up, came out and um, took the ATM card. And I told her, I gave them the pin. I remember telling you stories, so it's like, you gave them your pin? I'm like, what? <laughs> it's like, you were not there when you were slapping them. <laughs> Stop me asking me, I gave them my pin. No, man. They asked you to give them, you give them everything you're holding, including your shoe. So things like that don't matter when you think about your life or when you think about you know just money will always come and go. I want you to repeat that as a mantra every time that you feel that you're broke and you're like, or you feel like I think your life is come to an end, just remember that money will always come. Money will always go. But one thing is money will always come. So this is why it's obviously. Because I have to let me say okay. <laughs> okay, where was I? Okay, yeah. so um that wasn't the worst of that night. Um what I feared the most was what happened. Because I heard of stories like that, I heard of people who had gone through things like that, people who they say that just, you know, someone just pulls up and they ask them to enter a car, or they will enter a car and then they just find out that it's one chance, you know. So the unfortunate thing that happened that night was that I was raped. And um, it happened in the most unconventional way that I was about possible because the car was still moving. Um, I'm trying to make this as light as possible, but I'm already seeing some faces changing. Um, the car was still moving, I was wearing a jumpsuit, and if you know what a jumpsuit is, it means that you just want a tire. So you can't remove the other and still be wearing it, so you're totally naked. So I took off the jumpsuits, he asked me to take off my underwear, I fought the best way I could, but then it just didn't work, you know. And through it all, I kept pleading the blood of Jesus. In fact, as soon as I entered the car and I realized what was going on, I began to plead the blood of Jesus. I thought about so many people that come and share their testimonies and they say, oh, I just prayed the blood of Jesus like, you know, someone, someone, the car just stopped or someone just came and, you know, someone hit the car, the door burst open and I flew out, you know. <laughs> Nothing like that happened. Stories, um, I may cry a bit, so pardon me. Feel free to offer me to show your hanky, but I didn't bring one. But then, um, no one knows the contention of challenges nor the measure, you know, or can you measure the level of challenges until challenges hit you? 
and to contain your life, you've got to be prepared. Um, but no one can prepare yourself for the way life pans out. You can prepare yourself from now to tomorrow. But you can't still prepare yourself when the blow hits your heart. My foundation here in theater was very strong. Please don't take your presence here, or your going here, or your coming here for granted. It helped me. It saved me. You can hear me at the back? Okay. Alright, so it helped me, and it saved me a lot. And so, I will tell you that don't take your presence here in theater for granted. Now, um, after I got raped, it's amazing because like a few months ago, I couldn't even say the word rape. Even till now, sometimes when people are talking about stories of rape, I still cringe and I still feel somehow. It's only natural and human. Um, after I got raped, my life took a detour after that. At first I was determined, my first, my first reaction was that I was determined to not be one of those people that would get raped and then you just, you know, core in the corner or their life just become a shadow of what it used to be. I was determined to move on with life. I was determined to just be strong and fight for it all. I was determined to live my life like a normal person and not even be bothered by what had happened. But the truth is that you can't cheat the process. Are you writing it down? Yes, these are little points I'm just going to be telling you. I won't tell you these are seven steps to so I'll just tell you different things that I hope you catch, basically. Um, so I struggled with, you know, the issue of of having sex because um, why are you guys thinking about that? You don't know that something that is called sex. <laughs> but anyway, after I got raped, someone told me that two things happen to people that get raped. Either of two things. One, they either become very withdrawn, very reserved. They can't have a relationship with another man. They can't, you know, be touched by anybody else. They become very intimidated, you know, blah, blah, blah. Or they become very promiscuous. I believe very strongly, if I am convicted, that my case was the latter. But um, we bless God for God. So um, I had a couple of relationships with different men. One majorly was with a man who was even about to get married. And even after I got married, we still carried on with life, you know? Um, it was so bad. It was so bad that I didn't know which one I was struggling with. I got, if I was struggling from the nightmare of the ordeal that had happened, or if I was struggling from the anticlimax of having sex with someone I wasn't supposed to have, and when I wasn't supposed to be having it. Now let me tell you something. If you ever have a problem in life, sex is good, sex is amazing. But then, that's the way God created it to be. It's a beautiful act, but then God created it to be within the confines of marriage, and he has his reasons. He knows why every commandment that God gives you, every instruction, at the end of the day is for your own good. That's why he's a good, good father. At the end of the day, it's for your own good. Now, I was saying that if you ever have an issue, if you ever have a problem, don't ever return to sex as a solution. You have to save yourself. Take it anywhere. I'm telling you for free now. Don't ever do it. Even as a married person, don't do it because nobody can do for you what only God can do for you. It's not fair for you to put that burden or put that responsibility on someone else. That's actually idolatry in some way. So that means you're committing two sins at the same time. So, so yeah, you have, to be, you have to be very careful, you have to be very sensitive because these things, they happen. Something happens to you, you feel broke, you feel sad, you miss an exam. Or in my case, probably I didn't get a job or something outside. I was sitting down with my friend, two of us were crying before you it. So when we thought to another person's house, it was like, fame, it used to happen very fast. And then before you it, people are kissing, and then you know, go all the way. The truth is that if you're honest with yourself, when you're done, you actually don't feel so good about it. You know, so it's not worth it. Trust me, it's not. So yeah, moving on. Oh no, not moving on. That's actually what the story is. So, I, yeah, I was in this relationship and I struggled a lot. I knew I wasn't supposed to be there, but then I just couldn't get out of it. I was telling my sister last night, we were talking about it, and I was like, can you imagine that at that time it was such a struggle? 
I couldn't, like, even if I wanted to, like, I, because I really didn't want to, at some point I didn't want to, and at some point I did, at some point I didn't. But then I knew I should, you know, I, 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 I shouldn't be there, but then I couldn't. That's the power, that's the power of a sexual relationship, that's the power of a soul type. And you can't afford to attach yourself to that, especially when you know the kind of future that God has designed for you and destined for you. So, so yeah, it was it was a serious struggle. I went through a whole year, more than a year of depression. I didn't even know it was depression, but I went through a whole year of pain and unnecessary pain, pain that I brought upon myself because that one I literally brought upon myself. And I went through a whole year of just serious insecurities because I just I didn't know who I was anymore, and that's what sin does to you. It just blinds you, it confuses you, it misleads you. You forget where you're coming from. You don't even know where you're going. You don't even know who you are. You just don't know what life is about. You just be dead, handy. And that's exactly what happened to me. I, I was just there, you know? But thank you for PD and TA, especially these two, and my family members. PD was always there for me to run to, even TA. I remember Tia was, was, was tired of me because today I would call him for one and say, I said, I must talk to you. And I was telling him about this guy. And then another time I was telling him about that guy. At some point he was like, yeah, what do you do, do you think I'm happy now as I'm telling you this thing? You know? I'm sure that sometimes he's one just like TMI, this child. Just too much info, don't you know? But then it was it was always good to have a spiritual backing you know, and have mentors. But here is where it now also goes really serious. I stopped talking. I stopped calling them. I just wanted to just be on my own because people are not reminding me about this person. Or just the interesting. And so I was, I stopped talking. I stopped going to see them. You know, I would blame it on work. Say work is so hectic and here, you know, traffic. I'll blame it on so many things. But then the truth of the matter is that sin thrives in secrecy. What the devil wants you to do is that the devil wants you to keep quiet. Don't talk to anybody. Don't go and see anybody. Don't let anybody know about what you're doing. Because though in our case, you begin to deceive yourself. If they know about what I'm doing, they begin to judge me. I know I'm not perfect. God is working on me. Why don't you want to judge me? Lies. Stop lying to yourself. You stop talking because you enjoy, or let me judge it to myself, I don't know about you. You guys make mistakes. I stopped talking because I was enjoying what I was doing. I didn't want anybody to tell me, look, stop this thing, it's not gonna help you. Because it was so good, it was so nice, you know? And, I, and again, every time I will remember the incident of the rape, I say, you know, let's just call this guy. We go, we hang out, and we go it. And then, you know, just for a moment. But then he got married. In my heart of hearts, I knew I was going to marry him. You know, she with this. I knew that, you know, this can't, there's no way you can't. Can't see what, how would I come and tell me that, ah, really, it's like, <laughs> it's like this guy. You know, I knew it wasn't going to work, but then it hits me. And I was so sad, but then, you know, I was holding on to what wasn't even. At some point, the guy was actually telling me, okay, why are you crying today? Like, what do you want me to do? Like, if I divorce my wife, are you actually, will you be there for me to marry? And he said, no. He said, so, he said, so what do you want? He said, I couldn't answer. I would ask myself, Amy, what do you want? You know? But it's just that when the devil wants to hold you, yeah, the best God, because his hand is bigger. So, there are times when I'll be at work and I'd be on air and I'd just take a music break and I'd go to the bathroom, I'd be on the floor and I'd be shedding serious tears, I'd be crying, the pain was here. Like I can't I wish I could I wish I could show you. Let me try. You know, the pain was it was it was it was in the middle of my chest, you know, it was so thick. It was so thick, it was so painful, it hurt so much. And every single time I would cry, and I would shed tears, 
And I'll just ask God why. Okay, fine, I messed up, you know I did this. Just help me out here, just save me. And I went through different phases. I went through the phase of, okay, this is happening to me for a reason, maybe I will share my story one day. And then I went through the phase of, excuse me, but I said, damn it all to hell, I don't care. I'm going to share my story, come back, you know. And I have a thing somewhere, somewhere, or something else, excuse me, but anyway, that's what I mean. So I was going to do that when um, God showed me, you know, the painting. And someone walked up to me randomly and said, hey, I heard you know how to paint. And why don't you just, you know, why don't you go into that? And I said, okay, you know what I know. So I called Pili one day and said, Pili, I'm going to organize an exhibition. Pili has tried for me and TA because I would just call them out of the blue with all my many, many ideas and tell them, today I'm doing this, so we're all going together. And thank God for them that they all want the journey with me. So I started painting and I thought it was just about the art, you know. I, I just wanted to do this, but then God showed me, opened my eyes to see a whole world of perfected art. And that's why I'm here. Um, God showed me how I would be able to express myself, express my story and my pain and everything through my colors, through my creativity on canvas, and through everything else. And you know, I thought, oh my God, this is purpose. I've come into my own. And God is telling me, just calm down. Purpose is not just one thing. The purpose of life is to actually live and live for God. So, and in God, the God of seasons, let me explain that to you. Just turn with me, open your Bible to um, in a second. To Numbers, Numbers chapter 20, verse 10. Let's start from verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting in Tabernacle and fell on their faces before the Lord in prayer. Then the glory and brilliance of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and, and you and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock in front of them, so that it will pour out its water. In this way you shall bring water from out for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their livestock drink fresh water. And Moses and Aaron gathered gathered the assembly before the rock. Moses said to them, listen now, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his hand in anger, and with his rod he struck the rock twice, instead of speaking to the rock as the Lord had commanded. And the water poured out abundantly, and the congregation and their livestock were drunk fresh water. Basically, we all know this story. God asked him to speak to the rock, and he struck it. Well, he struck it because the last time God asked him to strike the rock, he struck it. So he just thought, you know what? Maybe God doesn't know what he's saying. Let me just strike this work so we can all be here fast, fast. Now, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to bring out of this story is that God is the God of seasons. God changes, God evolves. But then you have to be, you have to listen and you have to be obedient. God may be speaking to you in one way right now, and next week is another way. That's why it says, give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. For every day is a different bread. For every day is a different message. For every day is a different way, a different method. So, so yeah, just keep that. So anyway, so I thought this was my problem, but God said, this is it for now. It may change, so just keep listening and be obedient. So that's, that's, a, that's an issue of trust, okay? That's an issue, that's a, that's an, it's an issue of trust, yes. So you have to trust God or I have to trust God to know what my next purpose is. Now back to my story. I'm going to wrap this up really quickly. Um, through everything, through it all, through my whole experience, and through my whole life, one of the things I had to do was trust God. Because I can tell you, I spoke to PD, I cried with TA, and I had my siblings, was in part of it. But the truth is that nobody could help me. I can tell you that for a fact. Nobody could help me. Nobody could save me. Nobody could understand. My siblings are the most loving, the most loving siblings you'll ever find on this earth. I don't know about you. 
But then, as loving and as caring as they were, or as they are, they couldn't help me. And I had no choice. I had no choice but to look to God. Because at the end of the day, you can't put your trust in man. I hope when they sang that song, the choir, I hope you actually believe it because it's the truth. You can't put your trust in man. You can't trust anybody. The truth is that nobody can help you. Aside from the fact that human beings always disappoint, they're very subtle. The truth is that, like, you know, I went downhill because of these men. I'm the one who had to deal with different spiritual attacks on a daily basis. I'm the one who had to deal with so much. I'm the one who almost missed the love of my life. I'm the one who just was just there. I withdrew from everything that God wanted me to have. I withdrew from it. I pushed it away. I'm the one whose life was just thrown to the gutter. You know, so asking me to forgive them, that's like a lot. That, that was too much for me. You know, I remember Femi telling me that forgiveness is not for anybody, but it's for yourself. And so when morning came, I decided to call Pibi, but I just felt Femi didn't know what he was saying. And you know, Pibi said the same thing. And then Tia gave me a video to watch of this day that her whole family, her husband had been killed in a whole massacre of the whole town. And how, you know, she forgave them. And the same people, when they were in prison, she kept going to them to run prison. In my mind, I'm watching that video, in my mind, I'm like, what? It's not me. <laughs> Don't care about this baby. <laughs> but it, something resonated in me because as I watched that video, I thought to myself, if she could, you know, if she could get through this, then me, what am I holding on to? Because at the end of the day, your purpose and your goal is gone. So, um, so yeah, I began to think that maybe there's something here, and maybe I should actually deal with this. It's hard to tell you, because I had to open up a wound that I thought had healed. It's almost like peeling a scab. Have you ever had a wound that you had to peel a scab, or a scab just peeled on its own? You know what a scab is, right? Yeah, sorry to you. So, I was, I had to open up that wound again to deal with it. And it was the most painful thing ever. In fact, I don't know which one was more painful, either the ordeal that happened or having to deal with the issue that I had to forgive them. Because now there was anger, there was bitterness, and there was so much pain, you know, renewed pain. And just remembering it again, and just knowing that my life was like that, and that I could have gone somehow, was just, you know, it was really painful. And so I went through another couple of months of crying, morning after the night, and asking God why, why me? And this time I was asking God, why do you want to use me? Just leave me alone, like I've had enough, you know. And God again asked me, do you trust me? This time my answer was so fast. I was just like, ah. Ah. <laughs> I don't know, you know. But the truth is, God is good. When you sing that song, he's a good, good father, he needs it. Because when God asks you to do something, it's for you. It's for your own good, it's not for anybody else. I can't tell you that I've forgiven this man 100%. I'm like 79 to something. But I know for a fact that if I see them today, I'll be able to give them a hug and pray for them. Because you know what? I actually feel sorry for them if they haven't repented. Because no one says about touching your mind and doing the perfect normal. But this is what I want to, what I want you to take home with you. Don't take home the fact that oh, this auntie she was raped and you know. Take home the fact that nothing, no heaven, no the earth nor anger, nor pain, nor angels, any form of divination, shoes, clothing, no power, nothing can separate you from the love of God. And once you know that, once you are sure about that, once you trust that, there is nothing that can shake you. 
You need to, going into life, living your life every day, you need to be rest assured of the one who has your back. You need to be sure of the God that you're serving. You can't just be serving God anyhow, because the devil will be looking at you like I said, this one doesn't know what she's doing. Be sure. When you sing songs to God, be sure. When you close your eyes in prayer, be sure. Trust God. Trust that if God asks you, come and stand here, let this go, close your eyes and raise up your hand. Be sure that it's for your own good. It's hard, it's easier said than done, but trust God. If anything happens, trust God. Go to God. Like I said before, PNT couldn't help me. My parents couldn't help me. My siblings couldn't help me. My friends couldn't help me. But see, God was there for me. God was there for me. God backed me up. Like, you know when you're moving against the wall and you hit the wall, you know how solid it is? That's how I felt the solidity of God behind me. God backed me up. Is there anybody here that has gone through anything? Not necessarily rape or molestation, but there's something that you're going through emotionally and it's a burden. Before I finish this painting, before I finish talking, I would like for you to come out so I can pray with you. Because let me tell you something, above anything else, the peace of God is very important. The peace of God is what God has gifted me, and it's what I have. I carry it around and I wear it like perfume. It smells so good. So if you want, I'm not forcing you, but if you want, you can come out and pray with you before everything is over. One of the last things I'm going to say, and then we'll just sing a worship song and I'll focus on fiction, it's good now remind me, is this. There's a song that goes like this. Explains to me recently, and the name of the song is Baron Cage called it Breathe, but it was I'm Desperate for You. Now, that's a song of war. If you don't know, know now. For you to get over things in life, for you to get over and stop thinking about anything, you need to displace one thing with another. They'll tell you, take your mind off it, right? They'll tell you, think about something else. Try your best not to think about it. But then, if you want to stop thinking about it, in my case, I want to stop thinking about the fact that I was great. I want to stop thinking about the fact that I thought my life was worthless and that God didn't love me anymore, you know, or that I just felt like I just failed. But God told me, he said, focus on me. Focus on me. The Bible is not kidding when it says focus on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finish out your faith. The Bible is complete. The Bible knows what it's talking about. God knows what he's talking about. So you have to displace one thing with another. For you to stop thinking about something. For me to have stopped thinking about it, I had to focus more on God. I had to focus on Jesus. I had to focus on, I like, I, my friend would say, I look straight. I was looking at God, you know. And gradually, gradually, that beside it because only what you give attention to is what will grow. And so I stopped giving that attention. I started focusing on God. I started trying to patch my relationship with God back together. I started trying to build it. Spend more time in worship. I spent more time praying and reading the word and discovering God for myself. The music I play is very sweet. It's just so sweet. But then you need to be desperate. You need to be desperate for God enough that He will fill you up. Now, let's describe God. Let's describe God. You say God is big, God is massive, He's all encompassing, He's omnipresent, He's omnipotent, He's huge. The Bible says that the earth is His footstool. Do you know what the earth looks like? Have you ever read from the earth, the size of the earth? Do you know how many people live in the earth? And for that to be His footstool, do you know what a footstool is? It's to show you how big and how huge, and even still, the Bible also says that it has not even entered into the heart of man how to describe, like the human brain cannot pick up words or cannot form proper vocabulary to describe how big and powerful God is. And so imagine filling your mind with God. 
Will there be space for anything else? I'm asking you. There won't be. And that in itself is trust. Trust is in different forms. But the most sure God says to tell you that I've never left. I don't know who you are. I really want to carry on. I have a couple of things to say, but God says to tell you, I've never left you. He says, I'm closer than you think. I'm closer than your breath. I am your breath. God is your breath. You breathe in and out. That's God. That's how close he is to you. He has never left you. I don't know who you are. Do you want to come out now? I'll give you a hug if you want to. loved you and has always loved you regardless of everything that has happened but then there's a reason why there's a reason why there's a reason for your life and I pray that even as you receive your healing and you receive your deliverance I pray that it won't end here but God will use you he will use you to pass on the, the battle he will use you to pass on the the, the baton sorry and he will use you to he will use you as a vessel in healing other people because that's what God's love is about. It's about spreading his word, spreading his gospel, spreading his love. So I pray that even as God blesses you, you'll be a blessing to others. I pray for you today that what I most wanted for myself was peace. I just wanted to be okay. I wanted to be at peace. I wanted to just, I wanted my heart to be light. I wanted it to be clear. I wanted my life to be colorful and vibrant again. I wanted none of the darkness. And so I pray for you today from the bottom of my heart. I pray for you that the peace of God is your portion. I pray for you that the peace of God that has no bounds and has no holds is your portion. I pray for you that the peace of God will flow through you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet like mint. It will flow through you and it will be a soothing balm unto you. I pray that where you have wounds, even when you do not have wounds, God will give you a balm for each and every one of them. I pray that every scar that you feel, every place that anybody has ever touched or molested or violated, in any way, your skin, your mind, your spirit, your soul, your body, anyway, the stripes of Jesus will replace it for you. I pray that you'll carry on your backs the stripes of Jesus. I pray that you will carry on your heads the blood of Jesus. I pray that the peace of God will be your portion. I pray that you will go everywhere and people will perceive your aura and they will know that this one is of God. This one has been delivered by God. I pray that wherever you go, you will be a living testimony because the Bible said that we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. You will constantly overcome. You will daily overcome because it's a daily battle it's a daily struggle, but you will overcome. You will be victorious because you are of God, because you are a child of God. You will be constantly victorious. The devil has no hold on you because it is one thing to come out. It's one thing to hear the voice of God. It's another thing for you to believe it. I decree that you will believe it. I decree that it will become your mantra. It will become your life. It will become your spirit. I decree that even in your spirit, you will carry the assurance that God is your God. Because the truth is, he is the glory and the lifter up of your head. You will not carry shame as a name tag. You will not carry... You will not carry insecurity as a name tag. You will carry pride in Jehovah, the one who is your shield, the one who is your buckler, the one who is your pillar, the one who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's the one that is called your father. Let me tell you that today, you will walk around with the confidence that God has designed you to have in your heart. In your heart, you will 
carry the love of God and the love of God is all encompassing. The love of God will pacify you. The love of God will comfort you. The love of God will restore everything that the canker worms has tried to take. If the enemy knew better, he wouldn't have messed with you. If the devil knew better, he wouldn't have come near you because you know what? Let me tell you what God told Jeremiah. This happened to the children of Israel. I took them out of here so the Chaldeans will come and destroy this place. But so I needed someone to do it. So the devil has only been God's errand boy. God only used the devil so that you will come to this place of fusion. And I decree that you will reach the place of destination. You will be a testimony. You will be a person that will stand and your voice will be amplified to many. You will show the world. You will show the world that God is good. Even you just being as a person, in your standing, in your eating, you're talking, you're moving around, you'll be a testimony of God's goodness. You will put the devil to shame. You will put the devil to shame. And you will be a testimony of the living goodness of the living God that we serve. I bless God for you. I'm excited on your behalf. I'm excited on your behalf. And you know that this thing that God has started is not just it's not just ending today. So get ready. It's a whole world that God is bringing you into. It's a whole world that God is bringing you. You can look up now. You can look at me. It's a whole world that God is bringing you into. Let me tell you that you are set to be used by God. What you may knowing that God has touched you. Even if you don't feel it today or next week, but a seed has been planted. And let me tell you, when it's time, no one will tell you. You will know. And let me tell you something else too. When you go, don't be far away from your father. Don't be far. If you want to cry, cry as much as you want. But don't sit there in self-pity. Don't sit there wallowing in the fact that something has happened to you or anything has happened to you. Get up and move on with your life. The enemy doesn't like you to be active. The enemy doesn't like you to live your life. The enemy doesn't want you to fulfill destiny. But I have news for you. You will. God bless you. You can go to your seat. Let me quickly explain this painting. You see, this is just, this is a, can everybody, can everybody see this? Can you guys see? <laughs> Let me explain this painting as quickly as I can. You see, God showed me two sides, the dark side on the side, and the bright side. And he kept showing me how the devil likes to play mind games. One of the things that God showed me, I, I, I shared this with you. God showed me that people are going through emotional bondage. That's what the devil is trying to move. Now the devil is aware that we know that you know there's a spirit of devour, a spirit of death, a spirit of death. The devil knows that we know that you know we know his plans that he has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so he's trying to do things in a very uncanny and very. He's trying to be sleek and he's trying to be invisible about it. But we thank God for God because we are not ignorant of the vices of the enemy. So as you have the spirit of God, God will always reveal these things to you. And so yes, God showed me that the devil is always trying to play my game. Do you see, this whole canvas is your mind, all right? And on this side, green represents growth, green represents fusion, it represents life, pink represents the birthing of new things, and white represents life and the spirit of God, the presence of God, amen? Now this darkness represents everything that you will ever go through. Gray is a shadow. When a person is living in the shadows, except the shadow of God, the person is, you know, just is constantly gloomy and there's no hope there. And red represents the pain. There are different shades of red, I don't know if you can see it, but then it represents the pain and the anguish and the anger that you go through. But the Bible has said in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 2 or 3, I can't remember, but it says that those who survived the sword have found favor in the wilderness. I don't know if you understand that, but those who have come out of the pain, the battle, the anger, the anguish, the regrets, the betrayal, you've already found favor. He said those who survive it, and for you to be a survivor, you need to be a soldier. You need to fight. Fight for everything on this side. Because there will always be a war between light and darkness, but you need to fight. Okay? It's all one of you. You can come out, we can pray for you, we can touch you, hug you, and tell you everything will be okay. I can declare over you, PD can, anybody can, but the thing is that you have to learn how to fight for yourself. And in doing so, trust God to be your backing pillar. Trust God to be the overall general over your life. 
Okay? So these few words of mine. Oh, and I've been able to pass the